Hey everybody, we're starting our day here in Five Points Farm in Five Points, Alabama, and then we're gonna be traveling to Jemison, Alabama to see petals from the past. We're gonna be learning about their operations and how what they do impacts the student experience in the College of Agriculture. Cindy, tell us a little bit about your farm. We, um, we're here, in, like I said, in Five Points, just north of, a little bit north of Auburn on US 431. We have 20 acres here, and we have 3,000 wine grapes planted. And um, this next January, we're about to plant 300 more. So we, um, we started planting grapes in about 2014, and this is where we are today. All right. Alex. I was an intern for Cindy, and I just recently graduated from Auburn. All right. So can we take a look at your farm? Sure. All Let's right. go. Um, Megan, these are this particular row of our Lamanto, and, and as you can see, they've already started to turn. It's called Verizon when they when they start changing colors. What we did, and you'll see a little bit more, these 20 rows we planted first. This is what we call our test vineyard. Sometimes we call it the show vineyard. And we planted 20 different varietals. We planted six grape varietals, and we planted 13 muscadines. Mm -hmm. We kind of wanted to see, we, we researched what grapes would grow well, and we researched which ones, and we said, okay, let's plant these. Let's see how they grow. And uh, you learn a lot <clears throat> from doing that. And we learned what would grow, what wouldn't grow. And so that's kind of what we've got here. We, uh, we keep this up. And, it, and a lot of times when people come for tours and that kind of thing, this is kind of where we try to, to bring them because this is the pretty, the pretty yeah. part of the vineyard. We've got another area that's our production vineyard that's up on the hill. When we, when we started this, I, um, you know, I, had a, a, I have a vision in my mind. And my husband says, you know, I know you know exactly how you want everything to be. You just don't have it written down, and that's kind of pretty much it. But you know, we want to be a full functioning winery. Uh, he wants to host events. I've let him handle that side of it. But you know, we—it's it, just so beautiful, and I won't be able to people to be able to come here and and sit out here under our trees and just relax. And um, and the other things, I want to make award-winning wine. You know, I want to make good wine. I think that a lot of people—you can have a winery and you can have all the the extra things here, but um, if you don't make good wine, people aren't going to come back. So that, that's one of the reasons I have spent so much time developing my craft and developing the skills because I want to make award-winning wine. I, I, when uh, people drink it, I want to say, man, this is really good. I've not had anything like this. And, um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's what I want to do. And I want people to be able to come and enjoy it. You know, we're not that far from Auburn. I think it's a, be a great destination for people and, um, to come and visit. And like I said, just sit out here and enjoy it and enjoy the afternoon. Um, but you want to come in here and you want to look and say, you know, you want to pull, you want to leaf pull. You want to get, okay, red grapes don't ripen unless they're getting sun. See, this, this canopy is awfully thick. So that's one thing Alex would go in here and, uh, and, and pull the leaves mm -hmm. out um, <clears throat> so that, so that the, you can get the maximum amount of sun on your grapes. Because they're not going to ripen until they get the sun, the red grapes. Okay. So. What about pests and stuff? What are you looking for? Just Alex, tell her what you're looking for. What are you looking for? I would look for beetles. Mm -hmm. um, like on the grapes or on the leaves? On the leaves. I also would look for uh, aphids. And, and this is a good example here of um, ja damage from Japanese beetles. Mm -hmm. And so what we look for here is if <clears throat> you don't spray for Japanese beetles unless you're going to lose about a third of your crop. That's kind of the general, general rule. So these munched on these a little bit, we just leave it. It's, it's not gonna hurt the overall health of the plant okay. because there's so much more green. So they don't take out the actual fruit? They, they don't care about the fruit, the they leaves. just want the leaves. And then once it got a little hotter and the berries started to ripen, fruit flies were a huge issue. How do you get rid of those? We made traps, little sticky traps, mm -hmm. or there was, I think they had vinegar in them. Yeah. Well, 
one of the one of the uh, problems, and not just in grapes, but it's also um, we're, they're fighting it in blueberries and blackberries. It's got a spotted wing uh, Drosophila. Yes, it's a little devil of an insect. And uh, last year, that's one thing she learned. She made traps for those to see if we had them. And this year, we know we have them. They they don't um, hatch until it's 98 degrees. Typically, it's not 98 degrees till after July 4th. This year, it was 98 degrees before. So uh, we know we have them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Trent actually sprayed yesterday. We'll pick these in uh, uh, about six weeks. They'll hang about six weeks. We want them to hang as long as they can. It gets the, um, the sugar up. We just started testing. That's one thing Alex talked about she's gonna be doing when she gets, uh, does her internship in California is you're gonna test the bricks. The bricks is the sugar content. Um, we, we test three things. We test bricks, we test pH, mm -hmm. and you test uh, TA or titratable acidity. And you want all of those, those have to be balanced. And that, that's your indicator. Sometimes the bricks doesn't get really high. We, we want bricks, if we hit 20, man, we're excited. In California, they don't harvest till it's 24, 25. You know, they, they, they're gonna harvest at a much higher level. Yeah. California, you can't add sugar in the winemaking process. We add sugar. Um, you have to. Yeah. The higher the, the sugar content, mm -hmm. the higher the alcohol content. Yeah. So you would just take a couple off of a few, pick a few vines. And Typically, what we do is we, we take a hundred berries. Okay. We, a hundred berry sample. You don't take the end two end rows. About mm -hmm. well, about three in. You want from the middle, uh, and you just take, like I said, hundred berries, squish them up in a, a ziploc bag, literally, mm -hmm. and we have a bricks meter we test with them. Okay, cool. So once they've been harvested, they're ready to go, where do they go from there? We have a uh, walk-in cooler that we take, move them into. Mm -hmm. And we, we put them in, um, we pick in picking lugs, and we'll show you that in a little bit. We use the picking lugs and, um, so that the air, the air will circulate. Mm -hmm. in, in big production facilities, they use, um, they call them MAC bins. They're these big, huge bins. They dump them in there, but they immediately dump them out. We don't want to do that because they're stacked on one another mm -hmm. and the, the grapes are, they're deep in that, in that MAC bin and um, they're hot and they're going to start fermenting. You don't want them to. Yeah. Um, or, they'll, or they'll have other issues. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, we, we do those picking lugs and then the air circulates around mm -hmm. them. And usually they may sit there before we press them they sit there a couple days. Oh, okay. Till we have everything harvested, but usually no more than like three days. Oh, okay. So not long at all. So talk about that legislative piece of the wine industry. Um, you know, there's not a lot up up until like 2018, 19. There were about there were 20 or less wineries in the, in our state. And one of the and alcohol laws in every state are very restrictive. Alabama was no different, and we were wineries are hamstrung, were hamstrung, and you couldn't sell directly to a store. You could only sell through a third-party distributor. Well, as a small producer, we don't produce enough for a wholesaler to want to rep, rep for us, rep us. So we couldn't have festivals. I mean, there was just a lot of things that that we were very restricted about. But the biggest thing was the, was the. Um, uh, being able to uh, self-distribute. And, and one of the reasons we decided to grow grapes, we were talking about that earlier, is to make money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I did this as a venture to make money. I didn't do it just because I love wine or I was not even a big wine drinker. Yeah. Um, we did it to make money. Well, when you tell me, hey, you can grow it, but I'm not gonna let you sell it. It, it really is restrictive to small producers. Mm -hmm. So we, um, and I give Vicki Watkins all the credit for this from Whippoorwill Vineyards. She, she's very involved in Alpha. And Alpha took grapes on and adopted grapes mm -hmm. as a commodity. Every county Alpha organization and then the, the whole organization adopted grapes as a commodity. When they did, it allowed Alpha's uh, governmental affairs team to represent. We worked on that legislation and worked on it and met with them you know, numerous times. It got introduced to a committee in 2019, and Tom Watley was the chairman of that committee, passed the committee, went to the senator's desk to be put on the agenda and the calendar, and it, and it never was. It just got shelved. So 19, it was over. 
So worked on some things behind the scenes. And in 2020, um, same thing, went, got through committee, would have passed, I believe, if it, the session had not been shortened because of COVID. Well, in 21, um, went down there again. I think I've been to Montgomery so, so many times, they dread semi come. But so we're down there and it passed every committee, went on the Senate floor, the House floor, passed with no opposition. So now, if you're a farm winery, you can sell directly, you can self distribute to anybody that'll sell your product. So that opens up markets, market channels that we didn't have before. But there's a caveat to that is that 50% of your fruit to be a farm winery, to be able to do that, 50% of your fruit has to be Alabama grown fruit. So I think that opens up some markets long term for people who do want to just grow grapes. And it's a lot of work. Grow, doing the vineyard, growing the grapes is a lot of work. It's a lot of input. Um, you know, I have one full-time employee that is an Auburn graduate mm -hmm. that works and um, that, that works out here. And it's every day. I mean, you got to be out here every single day. You got to keep the grass cut. You got to, you know, you're, you're I, I know you probably saw like some leaves on the ground where he'd been leaf pulling. Yeah. It's just an everyday thing. And the, when they start, the shoots start growing, they grow six to eight inches a day. You go out there and go, oh my gosh. But it does, it's, it's like this energy, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. They're just growing and growing and growing um, during the day. So it's, a, um, it's an interesting, you know, you just got to stay on top of it. Yeah. And, I, and I tell everybody, it's the hardest work I've ever done. Man, it's the most fun I've ever had. So what are the biggest challenges on the farm? Labor, um, that's, that's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Weather. You have no control over that. People think you want a lot of rain. You want a lot of rain early in the season. But like now, I don't want it to rain now because the heat will help my, my grapes ripen and it also will make those sugars stronger. So I want it dry. I want it dry. That's why grapes in California reach that 25 bricks because it's dry and it's hot. Well here, it ain't dry usually. And if I let them hang and it gets so hot, if I had them let them hang too long, we have bunch rot and mm -hmm. so. And that's the other thing is, is diseases, you know, disease pressure. You have to constantly monitor that or it'll wipe you out mm -hmm. in a real short period of time. And then I think one of the things that everybody in ag is dealing with now is fuel. You know, we're spending, we're small. And uh, you know, I was spending $100 a week. Now I'm spending about $300 a week. You know, three and $400 a week for fuel just for our tractors and mowers and that kind of thing. Um, I think that's a real problem. So I, what I like about your vineyard is that you've done a lot of research and you have an extensive background in the harvest, the growing of the grapes. So tell us about your education. Well, when we first got into this, people asked me a lot of times, why, why did y'all do this? Well, honestly, we had this 20 acres. We have another business and we were looking at how it might play out and, and what, what do we want to do for, uh, for our retirement. I'm 62, so when we started this in 2014, I was in my 50s. Well, as we got into it, we found there weren't the, the technical resources here in our state um, because there were only a few wineries so I'm a, I, I want to know everything about something. So we decided, hey, we're going to take some college courses. And so I ended up completing the master's degree in viticulture and uh, enology. Mm -hmm. Viticulture is the science of growing grapes, enology the science of making wine. And I ended up doing a six week internship in Texas, which is a great big wine industry in a uh, production facility that processed 40 tons of grapes a day. The hardest work I've ever done in my life. <laughs> but uh, I learned a lot. But there is so much science to the growing and making the wine. It's, it's all science based and it's a manufacturing process. People look at it, oh, it's romantic, it's this. It really is a it's science and it's a manufacturing process. And you got to look at it from that perspective. People don't realize how science based agriculture is. There's so much chemistry, there's so much biology that goes into not just the soil and the plants, but the fertilizers, the herbicides. You need to have that background to understand what's going on. So, Alex, what got you interested in the vineyard winery industry? So, I came to Auburn wanting to do plant genetics. Mm -hmm. I took a genetics class and realized that wasn't really for me. <laughs> 
And so I decided to explore other options while still being able to stay in my major, which was crop and soil science. And I had lived in California before, and my parents are huge wine people, so they kind of brought it up. And I expressed an interest in that. And then the Ag Alumni Mentoring Program said that they had a mentor that made wine. So there you go, perfect match. So you were paired with Cindy, worked with her for nine months, and then she put you on as an intern. Yeah. So I was coming up here as much as possible while I was her mentee, at least every other week, pretty much, whatever my schedule allowed. And then we got along so well, and I got along with the people that work here as well. Mm -hmm. And so she offered me a job as an intern. Well, there you go. I, wish, I wish I had two or three of her. <laughs> <laughs> you can, there's nothing that will replace hands-on, nothing. And you can learn all the book knowledge, and you can, and, and Alex would attest to this, you know, you can, you read all these things, but when you're actually in that vineyard and you're putting your hands on it, and they talk about the anatomy of the, of the grapevine and the, and the leaf and all that kind of stuff, but when you see it, it all makes sense. It begins to make sense. So Alex, tell us about your experience. Yeah, so every single morning I would walk every single row and just look for abnormality, abnormalities. Yeah. So I was looking for pests, diseases, things that needed to be pruned, mm -hmm. leaves that needed to be pulled to help aerate the canopy of the vine. Um, like Cindy said, I pretty much just scouted the vineyard. That was my major project mm -hmm. of my internship. But I also got to learn a lot of skills that I didn't have the opportunity to learn growing up in the city. So I learned how to drive a tractor, <laughs> which was so much fun. And I also learned a lot about how the soil goes into the winemaking process, the terroir, as they mm -hmm. call it. <laughs> it was a really cool. fun yeah. and knowledgeable experience. So now that I've graduated, I will be moving to Northern California here in two weeks from tomorrow, actually. I'll be moving to a town called Ukiah, and I'll be interning for Decoy, which is a part of the Duckhorn portfolio. And I'm super excited about it because I'll be able to work in the lab and learn winemaking techniques, which I wouldn't have been able to get this internship if I hadn't had my internship with Cindy in the first place. Being able to, to learn, meet people in the industry, I think this is where the mentor program is important. Learning to meet people that work in the ag industry in all kinds of different fields, kind of give students an opportunity to see how the degrees match up with, with those ultimate career, career duties. We, um, it, it's a lot of fun. You know, we, we really enjoy our students and folks who work for us. And, and we're teaching also work ethic. You know, you, you need to know how to work. Uh, you need to be able, especially in this industry, you need to be an independent worker. If I got to have somebody I got to supervise all the time, then I don't want them. Or if I give them a task and then it, it doesn't get done, it could affect you know, long-term things. So I think you develop work ethic by doing that. And if, if mentors and people who hire them are, are smart, they will critique them and tell them those things. And you just get industry knowledge. You meet people in the industry, you get connections in the industry. You know, um, we've had two stu ag students that interned with us that went on in these type industries that helped them get other jobs. Alex is one, she's the most recent one, and we had a young girl several years ago, and she ended up getting a job in uh, Virginia at uh, Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home, managing and helping manage the gardens. But her working here, planting, setting fence posts, I mean, she literally helped set fence posts, pruning, all of those things helped her get that job. So I think that having that practical experience um, helps you, you know, long-term. And you also learn what you don't want to do. <laughs> The more you know, the more important you are. And one of your objectives today with, with Dr. Spears here is uh, to pick up some things that you might not be able to gain. Maybe, you know, that class moves pretty quick uh, that would be worth retention. It can be quite valuable because sometimes when you graduate and you look around, uh, how knowledgeable are you on it? What is the difference in this fruit? You know, every bit of character of knowledge that you can store up in this old head is beneficial to you. You'll find that out over time. So 
when uh, Doc Spears takes you to these different locations, oh my goodness, <laughs> you ought to just absorb that information as you go through because it's uh, ultra important. So Dr. Powell, tell us about um, petals from the past. Oh my goodness, that would take a while. <laughs> let, let, let me just tell you that uh, Petals from the Past is a wonderful garden area in the state of Alabama. We think central Alabama. Um, we specialize in almost everything in horticulture, uh, but uh, particularly with antique roses and great ornamentals. And uh, my specialty is in uh, pomology, our fruit culture. So we also uh, carry uh, 160 different varieties of fruit plants. All right, everybody know what you're looking at? These, these apples were planted in 2000. Look at this cluster here. All right, one, two, three, that's beautiful. Here's a fourth one, it's little, it's of no value. So I take it off. But notice, here's a spur that doesn't have a fruit, here's one it does. Here's a spur that no fruit, here's one it does. Spurs rest. They don't always produce consistently. They'll stop one year and rest a year or two, and then they'll come back and produce. And you're constantly producing new shoots. So as long as I've got good production of my new spurs coming out, like this one right here. Now, what would I thin, thin on that one? Uh, here is the smallest fruit on there. Here is one more, and let that, uh, that one rest, and if I wanted to, I could take this little one off here, but I would rather take that little one off, right there. We have a world of gardeners that enjoy growing edible crops, fruits in particular, and whether it's an apple, a pear, a peach, a plum, a blackberry, a blueberry, and citrus. We have lots of people interested in growing citrus. So uh, our <clears throat> uh, plants that we have <clears throat> fill a gap at petals. Most nurseries excel in the spring and to a little lesser degree in the fall. With the fruit, it is commonly purchased by gardeners in the wintertime. So in the wintertime, we're selling fruit plants. When Mother's Day ends and the sales on roses and other things go down, suddenly our blackberries and blueberries are coming out. And they keep coming all the way with our tree fruits until we get to Christmas. And we're able to, we have cool storage, so we're able to extend our season as we need to, uh, whether it's a, a restaurant uh, needing fruit, or whether we're retailing fruit right here at Petals, or during the Christmas season, we ship fruit. So we have lots of, uh, areas where we provide expertise in uh, both the production and growth of plants, as well as utilizing the products of the plants like fruit. So Dr. Spears, tell us about your class that's here today. Uh, it's my tree fruit culture class, and um, they are all horticulture majors for the most part. It's a senior level um, graduate student class and so a lot of them will um, will end up working in the fruit and vegetable industries. Um, some of them are interested in in orchard management and those type of things. Some of them might go more in, in vegetables or you know they're, they have varied interests but they're all fairly close to graduation if they're if they're still undergrads. My favorite part of the trip would probably have to be walking around with Dr. Powell and the other farmers because, you know, they're the ones that are out here putting everything together, making everything happen, making the sales and getting us the produce that we want. So getting able to be walking around with them and just gaining every bit of knowledge and wisdom that they have to share is, is really good. So why do you think it's so important to take students outside of the classroom and experience something like this? Well, they they hear me me talking a lot, and um, and I can go over a lot of the basics and the best management practices, and you know through lectures and the, you know the principles of of, of uh, horticulture. But um, but this is where they they get to experience it. Most of most of us that majored in horticulture and had an interest in horticulture, it, you know, we got into it because we like being outside and doing things and and growing plants, and um, and this is just a 
a great opportunity for it to to stick with them what I talk about in class but then to gain I always gain a, a lot more by coming myself and learn more um, e each time and so I'm um, actually seeing it and hearing from the growers and they can ask ask whatever they want to the growers that um, that really helps helps the learning process I believe I see this field trip enhancing my academic experience because I personally enjoy hands-on learning and I'm a visual learner and so it allows all of those hours spent in the classroom listening to Dr. Spears and um, all of his knowledge from the PowerPoint slides just come to life whenever we get to visit um, such large-scale orchard and uh, agriculture production facilities such as petals from the past. Uh, a lot of these young people when they go out I can tell you right now <clears throat> when somebody's gonna hire them, they wanna see what they did outside of the classroom. Yeah. And the more you can pad that thing with honest information, the better off you are because working at pedals is a benefit to these students. Mm -hmm. They can say yes, and people in this state, Rick, okay, you, you had expertise at pedals and you did this and this yeah. and this, that's great, that's good background. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we remind them of that. <laughs> when they get tired sometimes. <laughs> We're in about our 10th or 12th, 13th year, uh, and we bring in one or two interns a year. Okay. So most of them are from Auburn. Yeah. Now, what Jay is able to do at the university because of our connection with the university is uh, if that person fulfills that internship, they'll get credit for the course he's teaching on tree fruit mm -hmm. today as though they were in his class. And that's the benefit of it. And an internship means a great deal. Mm -hmm. We're a retail business. We cannot afford to run people away. That's not our deal. We bend over backwards to be nice to people. And although some people don't want to do that, and the people who wholesale fruit, they don't have to worry about it because somebody a thousand miles away is buying their fruit. But if, you, if you're doing a retail operation, it's a little bit different because we are weekly working farmer's markets. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say we probably move about 60% uh, of plants off property mm -hmm. and about 40% on property. <clears throat> Some years it'll vary. Mm -hmm. Some years we may, we may be stronger and pick your own. One of the things people like to do is to come to a destination and be able to walk out and pick fruit not step on snakes, not have to fight the woods to pick their crop. And we, we have it so that people can enjoy our, our fields, our orchards. Uh, it's easy, easy harvest, uh, easy maneuvering. We need return customers. We want people, because again, we're a retail business. We're not shipping our stuff, well, most of it, a thousand miles away. Uh, to, to where somebody else buys it. Uh, when we go into Birmingham to the farmer's market and, and many other places, or when they come here, uh, we, in many cases, we, we know their names. We have people who visit our property here several times a year. It's almost like shopping at a supermarket because they buy what they need at a given time. Maybe it's a fruit plant. Maybe the next time they come, it's a fruit they can eat. Maybe it's a rose that they want for a special day. So no matter what you desire in the horticultural area, uh, we tend to provide a, a majority of things that people enjoy doing and having, uh, people like gardening. They like to put something in their, in their garden that they enjoy. So what tips do you have for students that go on other field trips? Like what, what should they be doing when they go on a field trip? Well, I try to, I build it up to my class. Mm -hmm. Like this, this is your one, you know, maybe your one opportunity to, um, to have the growers ears, to, to get your questions answered. You know, I, I can only guess at what the, the growers do. I, I talk about all these different practices. There's different, so many different ways to prune and grow trees and grow fruit trees. Um, they all do it differently. And so that's, um, it's a real opportunity for it to be very impactful and for them to take advantage of, um, of getting the knowledge from these growers that are actually doing it, you know? Yeah. They, um, 
I, I try to stress the importance of them, them uh, engaging. Yeah. So come prepared with questions, essentially. Yes. I have to give them an assignment, to be honest, to really make them, <laughs> <laughs> make them ask questions. Yeah, but ask questions, so there you go. Yeah, short answer is ask questions. Ask questions. I think this will benefit my, my future and benefit my career, being able to see every different aspect of fruit production, um, being able to hear the different ways that things can be done, uh, different types of IPM, um, different types of irrigation rates and fertilizers, and you know, just every little piece puts the puzzle together. Well, thank you for having us here today and hosting our students time after time. Oh my goodness, my pleasure. Providing them an education outside the classroom. So. Well, this will help them. This lets them engage what's going on outside mm -hmm. of the classroom. And they can pick up some things to better understand why they're sitting and they're taking notes and doing all this stuff. Yeah. Because there, there, there is an end to this. There, there is a destination for them, every single one of them.